All right, greetings folks. Uh, welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Council for British Research in the Levant. Today's webinar will be on the book, uh, the new book by Professor Daniel Marvecki entitled Germany and Israel. My name is Dr. Tofik Haddad. I am the director of the Council for British Research in the Levant's Jerusalem branch known as the Kenyan Institute. Today's event is being hosted by the Council for British Research in the Levant in partnership with the Education Bookshop in East Jerusalem. The Council for British Research in the Levant is an independent UK research charity and membership organization that exists to conduct, support and promote humanities and social science research in the, in the Levant. We are one of eight international research institutes affiliated with the British Academy and we host organizational branches in Jerusalem, Amman, and the United Kingdom. Uh, today's event is part of uh, a regular series of webinars, which you can check out on our webpage at www.cbrl.ac.uk. We've had uh, a great list of previous webinars and we have some more planned. So please check us out and also sign up for membership. Today's event is a particularly interesting one that's been able to generate a lot of interest online. If I'm not mistaken, uh, we had over 170 different uh, people who signed up for this event, including folks from uh, different uh, diplomatic missions who expressed their interest in being a member of this event and uh, attending it. Today's event is, uh, will be focusing on uh, Dr. Marvecki's latest book, as I said, uh, uh, Germany and Israel, subtitled Whitewashing and State Building, which came out from Hearst Books in 2020. Unfortunately, the book came out in the middle of COVID, so it hasn't had the opportunity to get very far we all, uh, in terms of his ability to do public outreach, but we hope to be able to have this webinar. We'll, we'll make up for some of that. We also would like to acknowledge that this um, webinar was initially uh, 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 set for about a week ago, but because of COVID and the fact that Dr. Marvecki uh, recently moved to Hong Kong to take up a position, that uh, he was under strict quarantine guidelines in Hong Kong and uh, in his where he was located was not able to have a, a strong enough internet connection, so we rescheduled it for this week today. Uh, Dr. Marvecki is a lecturer now in Hong Kong University's Department of Politics. He previously taught in Leeds, London and in Leipzig and holds a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Before his PhD, he worked for a brief time also with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in East Jerusalem, in occupied East Jerusalem. We're very happy to have him here. We're very interested to hear more about this topic and I think the results of this uh, webinar sign up show demonstrate that there's a lot of interest out there. Before we actually start, I would like to just give a brief outline of how this event will take place. After my brief introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Marvecki will give a presentation for roughly 20 to 30 minutes, um, followed by a series of questions, perhaps 15 minutes from myself to warm Dr. Marvecki up and also to provide an opportunity for folks in the audience to be able to come up with their own questions, which we ask that you direct to the uh, question and answer button on the Zoominar uh, uh, page, so to speak, that you're watching this event from. Even though we are currently also live streaming this event from the CBRL webpage in London, as well as the Kenyan page in Jerusalem, as well as our, uh, our co-partners in this, the Educational Bookshop should also be uh, uh, web broadcasting this event today. And we'd also like to make special thanks to uh, Hearst Publishers for offering copies of this book, which as I said previously, can be obtained in Jerusalem at least through our partners, the Educational Bookshop. Uh, I ask that uh, uh, those who do want to ask questions be brief and succinct and, uh, and polite. And uh, as I said, simply do it th only through the webinar. We do not have the capacity to go through uh, Facebook questions as well. So with that brief introduction, allow me to pass uh, 
on the stage to our uh, Dr. Marvecki today to give his presentation and I'll come back on once he's done to start with some of the question and answers. Go ahead, take it away. Good evening, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for coming. It's 11 at night in Hong Kong, where I'm talking to you from my hotel room. I'm glad you can make it. Let me start. Most books, their stories can be told from their covers and titles, at least partly so. I think in the case of this book, the cover and the title give away most of the story already. I trust that you can see my shared screen where you can see the book cover. So the title is straightforward, Germany and Israel, whitewashing and state building. So what I tried to do was to write a political analytical history of the relationship between those two states. And what I'm arguing essentially is that this relationship started off from an exchange, an exchange between whitewashing for the German, the West German side, and state building for the Israelis. I'm arguing that there was no other reason these two states, out of all states in the world, should start relations apart from these, whitewashing for Germany, state building for Israel. I'm not arguing that this original exchange carries through unchanged till the present day, but I do say that it structures and shapes the relationship until today uh, in many important ways. The cover is interesting. We took it from a mural on some remnant of the Berlin Wall. So for those who have visited Berlin, you might have seen, you know, what's left of the Berlin Wall. Um, parts of the wall run along the Spree River between the Obermaumbrücke and the Ostbahnhof. And this is a mural by a German artist called Günther Schäfer. It's basically the German flag, the um, black, red and gold, uh, on which the Star of David of the Israeli flag is superimposed. So you have a kind of... Um, a connection and intermingling of those two flags. And it's a very German picture. And it's with this picture that I start off the book um, by arguing that for Germany, present day Germany, the relationship with Israel is extremely important to its identity, to its image, to the way the state understands itself. I mean, Israel and Palestine are small places in the world, but to the German self image, Israel is extremely important today. However, if we look at the relationship historically, this hasn't always been the case. And in fact, the argument that I am making that this is an exchange between whitewashing and state building is not the argument made by uh, the German government, by German politicians, or in fact, is this debated in German society? Um, not very much. I mean, for those of you in our Germany, we like to talk about ourselves. And essentially, every time in Germany people talk about Israel, or by extension the Palestinians, what they really tend to talk about is themselves, their own identity. Hence why this topic of German-Israel state relations, of the actual relations, is talked about surprisingly little. And there's not too much research and I would say that this is the first book that critically tries to look at the relationship from the post-war beginnings uh, to the present day. I'm a bit surprised that nobody else has written the book, maybe I've overseen something, but I think it's good for me. So let me just quickly talk about the argument. I'm not going to read from the book extensively, um, if you wish to read it, you know, you can visit the educational bookshop and have some coffee, have a read. But just quickly walk you through the argument. So in 2008, Angela Merkel said in the Israeli Knesset that the security of Israel is part of the German reason of state. And she means what she says, and there's a material underpinning to what she says, right? 
But in fact, Germany was most important to Israel and its security um, before 1967. This is when Germany played a major role um, in the Middle East, right? That is the state building part of the argument um, into which I'm going to go, um, you know, in a few minutes. So Germany is most important to Israel in the 1950s and 60s through operations, financial aid and military aid. Right. This is also the time, of course, that Germany is still most marked by the Nazi past. So this is the time when Germany um, is only beginning to confront, you know, its very recent barbarism. So why would Germany and Israel entertain such close relations um, at this point in time? The reason is not any ideological affinity. In fact, the two states, you know, could have been, could not have been more different um, than during that time. The only reason for Israel to enter relations with Germany was pragmatic material to gain the means to build the state. And for Germany, it was a very elegant way to whitewash its stained vest. And at the time, this was very much acknowledged. So I begin the book with a quote by Konrad Adenauer, the first German chancellor, who says on German television in 1966 that the reason Germany paid reparations to Israel was to A, regain international standing, and B, because, and here I quote Adenauer, some sort of Jewish power that still influenced the German position in the world. So there was a strong dose of anti-Semitism as well um, that I trace throughout the diplomatic files of the Foreign Office. So it's really a kind of a bizarre, cynical and weird um, story, the origin story of German-Israeli relations, which I'm telling mostly from the German side. And this is where I think the book is maybe at its most bizarre as well, because you're looking at these people who have served in the previous Germany, um, who are now trying to make sense of this relationship with Israel, right? So that is the whitewashing aspect of the argument. The state building aspect is this. I mean, for those who are knowledgeable about Middle Eastern history and the Cold War, you will know that the US only took over the role of Israel's primary supporter after 1967, right, or from the mid-60s onwards. And be before that, I am showing or trying to show and arguing that it was Germany that played uh, this part, right? So I'm tracing um, the reparation payments, which are basically an industrialization program, financial aid and military aid, and showing that Germany played a role that was more important than that of the US, Britain or France prior to 1967, um, which was when Israel's security that Angela Merkel talks about 2008 uh, was not at all secured in the region, right? So this is when Germany was at its most important. And this is a massive role that I think is completely undervalued in the history of the Middle East conflicts. Then, of course, or not of course, but then the book goes further. Uh, I look at the time beyond 67. I trace um, the relationship uh, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then also after unification. And then I also take a closer look at the German role in the Oslo process. And afterwards. So this is Germany and Israel. What about the Palestinians? <clears throat> the book itself is mostly a book about German foreign policy and because of the topic it's also a book about how Germany has dealt with its past. But it's very much a foreign policy book in the first place. How is Germany implicated in the Palestinian predicament? Currently, that question is debated in Germany um, in a debate about the post-colonial theorist Achille Mbembe, whoever follows, um, you know, German debates will know what I'm talking about. But the question is, which role did Germany play um, for the Palestinians, at least by implication, right? 
today, I would say this question is mostly discussed in moral terms. Germany assumes responsibility for Israel. The question is, does it assume responsibility or does it have to assume responsibility uh, for those who had to make room for Israel's creation, the Palestinians? And here I don't try to answer this question in any normative, political, uh, moral sense. Rather, I try to look at how the German foreign policy apparatus, um, you know, the Kanzler and the Chancellery, um, the Foreign Office has looked at the Israeli-Palestinian question. And it's very clear that from the beginning, Germany was, of course, aware of Palestinian um, displacement. However, it did not give too much notice due to massive population displacements all around the world. And it didn't forge any moral connection between uh, Israel and, and the Palestinians, right? And this isn't to be expected because the German uh, connection with Israel was not a moral one in the first place, right? This is a story about state interests. And basically what you can see until the Oslo process is that Palestinians are seen in a very instrumental manner. Basically, they are a way to improve or not to improve relations with Arab states, notably um, in the oil crisis of the 1970s. And then with Oslo comes this moment of what I think was a genuine hope for many in the German foreign policy establishment that you could now dissolve that dilemma between you know, relations with Israel and that with the Palestinians. As we all know, Oslo failed Germany fund was a significant funder of the Oslo process. I was you know, able to, to look at the German role um, as well through my work with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung before the PhD, which I'm still very grateful for. However, basically, as, as we know, Oslo is dead, but Germany still speaks the language of the two-state solution. But the reality it is helping to fund is a very different one. So this is also something I try to look at in the book. But mostly this is a book about Germany and Israel and whitewashing and state building and how this exchange is relevant until today. So I do think that the book tells an interesting story. I hope so at least. I try to make it interesting. Politically, its implications are far from clear. I'm not even sure what the political implications um, could be um, apart from a general sense. But so far, reactions... You know, the reactions I had uh, to the book have been interesting and they ranged from enthusiasm to very strong criticism across the political spectrum. So I'm hoping that for those interested, that the book is able to confuse and maybe also make some people angry. And yeah, that would be my hope. That would be great. Now, I've, I think I've done my 15 to 20 minutes. I would be open to questions. What do you say, Tufik? Well, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I'm happy to start up this conversation, uh, if you are. Uh, so I've prepared a set of questions, and these questions are simply, I uh, intended to warm you up and get a little bit more details out of it. I would like to thank you and also Hearst for providing the copy of the book, which I was able to uh, read myself. And I congratulate on a fascinating, very well-written, very well-researched book, uh, caveating all that with the fact that I don't know the literature and I, I don't know uh, uh, deeper German uh, literature sets around this issue. So, uh, but to the lay reader, so to speak, it, it uh, it is, um, it is an account of somebody with uh, a lot of acumen in, and command over a set of uh, resources that are unfamiliar uh, to uh, even those who have interest and uh, knowledge of the Middle East and, and the Palestine-Israel question, so to speak. And, and for that reason, I think I, I wanted to kind of start this conversation by perhaps asking you about your methodology, the existing literature sources, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, their accessibility, particularly to English language audiences, and what you see as your unique contributions to this debate. 
these debates. Right, thank you. So when you try to sell a book, you of course try to oversell it, right? It's not like I'm the first guy who wrote on German history. That's far, far, far from true. But if I look at the literature on that relationship from that looks at it through a foreign policy, international relations lens, not a kind of inner German or inner Israeli perspective, then the field becomes very, very, uh, uh, you know, thin. And most of the books that do exist just retell the German story of that relationship, which means that you get a, an, an academic version of an already ritualized political talk, right? Which I would argue is rather boring. Um, if you look at how the German politicians talk about the relationship, the, the, the whole debate is completely ritualized, right? It's always about morality and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, we have the far right rising in, in Germany. Um, you know, we have Nazis on the streets attacking people. But, uh, you know, we, we do this, like politicians do this morality talk still, right? It's kind of a shield. And I think academic writing has too often just copied this, right? Without doing the necessary work. And, you know, this is where the methodology comes in. I, I mean, I do international relations, but I believe that history is uh, the best social science subject that we have. So I did a lot of research in the foreign office archives in Germany where I was lucky because I found a lot of files where I was the first one to, to open them, uh, a lot of which have been only very recently declassified uh, and classified as top secret. So that was great. Um, so that was good detective work. Um, there's an abundance of material, so you could write three to four more books out of this, which I'm not going to do, but I'm happy for others to, to do that. So yeah, so the methodology is historical and the field, I think, is much too close to German government discourse to provide work that is really interesting, All right? If I look at the Israeli side, authors such as Tom Segev, who I managed to interview with this book, they are, of course, you know, that's a totally different league and story. Like, these are people I, you know, kind of look up to um, in terms of the writing. But I think if you look specifically at the set of literature on German foreign policy, I think I think my book is quite quite new. I hope so at least. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written it. Well, yeah, I think I think the book's strength is actually its ability to bring together a lot of different sources uh, that are out there but uh, haven't really been combined, including both normative as well as non-normative accounts. Uh, but I'd like to sort of transition into the sort of more core of your of your argument, so to speak, which is embodied in your uh, subtitle, in which you repeated the question of whitewashing and state building, and actually uh, going a bit further uh, on each of these two elements. You write on page, on the concept of whitewashing, on page 22, you write, the practice of paying reparations and restitution is also a practice of writing history and determining who is remembered and who is forgotten. Can you please explain this quotation? Mm -hmm. Uh, and are, uh, who was being remembered, who was being forgotten, and uh, are you really right. questioning whether Germany was being sincere with its reparations payments? Mm, mm, mm. So the debate I'm going into there is the debate on German reparations after World War II and the Holocaust. Germany after World War II very much focused on Israel first, so the reparations treaty was about reparations to the Israeli state, paid in the forms of um, commodities and industrial goods. So it helped uh, to it helped with Israel's industrialization. That was the point of the reparations treaty. So Germany at that time wasn't the kind of moral Germany of today itself, with a lot of problems. But what I'm arguing is that Germany did right in focusing on the Holocaust as the specific major crime of National Socialism. But, of, but in doing so, it left out all the other crimes that were there, right? So Germany today has, an, has a surprisingly um, not very complex view of Nazism, I would argue. 
by leaving out many, many victim groups um, of the time in its reparation policy. So there is a, a tension there in the focus on Israel and um, Jewish victims, which is you know, correct as in, you know, that was a specific, like the specific genocidal core of Nazi policy. Um, but this has also led to other victim groups being forgotten, more or less. And this is what I mean by, by writing history. So the, the act of paying reparations is also an act of, of writing history. So no, I wouldn't say that Germany was sincere. I mean, that's part of the argument, right? And um, that's part of the whitewashing argument. So I'm showing how you know, there's a debate within the German state apparatus about this whole reparations question and how basically Adenauer walked the middle of the road between those who didn't refuse negotiations and those who, who wanted them for moral reasons. He wanted them for whitewashing reasons, for reasons of German rehabilitation. So that is what I'm arguing. Okay, about the second uh, side of the subtitle, the question of state building, you also allude to it not being just sort of a generalist state building, uh, but actually you say it's a kind of targeted state building. They were trying mm -hmm. to build particular kinds of state. And if I might add, you're actually also intoning that it's not just a state building for Israel, but it's also part of the restate building of Germany. Yeah. Can you shed light on these elements? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I wanted to be more academic, I could call the whole thing an exchange between symbolic state building for Germany and material state building for Israel, right? So what Germany got out of this exchange was the symbolic, the identity means uh, to recreate its state. I mean, the German state was already there, right? It just had to be kind of rebuilt, uh, uh, you know, with a bit of outside help. But this was about the identity resources um, of Germany. And for Israel, it was a purely material question, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, most Israel, I mean, basically all Israel, like nobody wanted anything to do with Germany. Um, but to build the state, German aid was necessary. There is a discussion about how the reparations agreement, you know, industrialized the state, how um, military, uh, relations were crucial to 1967 and so on. So for Israel, this was state building in the purest sense, industry, weapons, money. And there was no other reasons uh, other than those reasons um, uh, to engage with, with Germany. Which is also why, you know, these states are kind of, like in a way they are very close, but also they are very, very far apart because they wanted to get like quite different things out of this original exchange, right? So if you listen to German policymakers, you know, they like to talk about the close relationship, but I think this whole idea of a close relationship, you know, this is already what Germany got out of the exchange. So I think we have to look one step, take one step back, um, because Israel surely doesn't talk as much about Germany than Germans talk about Israel. Mm. So this is why I'm saying this original exchange is still very much, much there. Sure, sure. But uh, you do allude, uh, I, I would note, to, to the fact that the German state used some of these reparations for the uh, injecting funds into its own military industrial complex, particularly around shipbuilding, which I mm. found quite interesting. And this yeah. created parallels for me for how the U.S. defense uh, military industrial complex, if you will, basically does similar things. If I'm not mistaken, about 80% of US aid to Israel actually doesn't even leave the country. It just goes straight to US defense contractors. And Germany yeah. was the one who was actually doing this first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ash, thank you for bringing this up because this is really important because the exchange is unequal. Um, back in the day, Germany was more important to Israel than Israel was for Germany, which you can already see just by looking at um, you know, the material effect is the money and the stuff, right? For Germany, the reparations agreement was profitable or turned out to be profitable in economic terms only. Because we are talking about um, deliveries of, you know, industrial goods, commodities, all of that stuff, um, building industry um, or, you know, ships, which, you know, for Germany, this was basically a, a kind of Keynesian uh, Marshall type uh, program. 
right? So this was beneficial to the German economy, and I'm showing that. Um, it helped rebuilding the German ship sector, which, you know, uh, you just mentioned, um, which, you know, was prohibited, uh, you know, after the war. Um, there was one, uh, it's really, I think it's Yigal Alon who said that, you know, the Germans, um, you know, they don't want our weapons because they are good. They want our weapons because they are Jewish. So there's two things. And he was completely right. So that Germany wants a relationship with Israel um, because, you know, if Israel sells us weapons, you know, our rearmament is completely legitimate. I mean, you could argue against that. So there's that, the identity part, but there's also the part that you are talking about that, you know, this is a profitable undertaking. And yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Some of the most fascinating elements of the book for me were uh, revolved around the actual contributions that uh, German military aid made to some of the key Israeli performances in 1956, 67, and 73. I think to our readers who, uh, readers, excuse me, <laughs> listeners uh, who haven't had the chance to read the book, uh, it would be interesting to actually hear about those because they're quite significant and uh, Nobody seems to know about them. Mm, mm, mm. Let me just talk about 67 because I don't want to do a long military history here. But I think 67 is the, the key one in any case because that was when the US didn't play the role it played in 73, uh, for example. I mean, as you know, 73 was the one with US help, um, but that was not the case for 67. So in 67, um, the Israeli jets were bought from France, right, as you know. But the tanks, they came from Germany. In fact, they came by a triangle trade from the US through Germany to Israel. Germany had to pay for them and deliver them, carry the risk of being exposed to the Arab states. Because, you know, at the time, the US did not want to appear as a you know, openly colonial force in the Middle East. And Germany, for a number of problematic reasons, has this cloud of not being a colonial power, which, you know, is only true for the Middle East, of course. Um, so there, the whole ground battle was won with, you know, German delivered um, tanks. And on top of that, you have to, uh, of course, add the whole military exchange that came before that, the German, uh, you know, Germany buying weapons from Israel, um, delivering all kinds of like lighter weapons to Israel and so on and so on. The problem with these types of histories is that military history can be quite nerdy and quite boring and I'm not a military history guy, but I'm trying to make um, you know, this argument as concisely as possible, also by giving quotes. So for example, after 67, I look at the German diplomatic correspondence, right? And so the ambassador from, the, from, from Washington, from the US is, is writing back to Bonn that you know, this was a victory for the West, everybody is happy, we did well, and the German ambassador to Israel, um, you know, after 65, they have diplomatic relations, he writes back that um, the tanks that we delivered proved their worth in excellent fashion, you know, this is what the Israeli, Israeli army told me, um, we did well. So this was very much, uh, you know, very intentional, that, was, that wasn't just some uh, accidental by effect, right, that was intentional. Uh, policy and it worked so yeah i'm trying to show that and i think the fact that i'm not a military historian is maybe um be a good thing so i'm keeping it relatively brief and hopefully you know uh, insightful still sure. but yeah the, um you, you consistently characterize german israel relations or, or as germany as israel's second most important ally uh, after the united states but another consistent theme of the book is the secrecy and almost duality of the relationship, how Germany has one kind of public face, but also sort of an, an internal side. Now, maybe that's not particular to Germany, so to speak, but secrecy is an element of this story. And you, you also complain at several times that you can't get certain information about certain things, but they're still secret. Uh, can you sort of uh, have a dis uh, dis discuss a little bit this issue of secrecy as well as the duality? Why the secrecy? Israel in one sense, sorry, Germany in one sense claims that it's, uh, Israel is its ally. We give them the weapons. What's going on here? Exactly. Um, it's an interesting point because I also ask in the book, well, 
you know, if Germany is so proud of this relationship, why not put it all in the open? Like, why not say, look, you know, we were super important, you know, to Israel's existence until today. You know, why doesn't Germany turn this into a source of national pride even? Because the relationship is a source of patriotism, of nationalism, you know, to Germany. So this is a very apt question. Um, back in the day, of course, the it was all about the Arab states, right? I mean, this is the Cold War. You have uh, Egypt, Syria, which are, you know, kind of, you know, part of the non-aligned world. And the whole Cold War is, you know, of course, like, you know, raging around these kind of undecided uh, states, which are able to play out, you know, the two superpowers. So it's also a question of not totally uh, worsening the German image in the eye of Arab states. So that was a massive concern at the time. And also with that secrecy, Germany bought, you know, Israeli satisfaction and happiness, um, you know, so they couldn't, they wouldn't complain about the continuities of German, uh, of Nazis in the state, uh, for example, right? You can see this around the Eichmann trial where I'm showing that Germany withheld, you know, weapon deliveries until the Eichmann trial uh, was done in a way that did not uh, kind of put the German government into a bad light, you know, which it would have deserved. So there's this aspect as well, you know, this kind of background dealing, um, buying silence of the Nazi continuities. I think there's also an aspect that and the Arab states, those are two big aspects. Yeah. Sure. And then you have the general secrecy around military stuff, right? Yeah. Um, it's also hard to, 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 you know, look at German weapon deliveries to Saudi Arabia, for example. So it's not only, only Israel. It's that uh, specific aspect of German foreign policy in general. Sure. Uh, I'll ask a couple more questions, Daniel, uh, but I'll also invite uh, folks who are on this webinar to uh, uh, type up their questions if they have them through the question and answer button. My next question has to do actually with an element that you brought in, which has to do with the Cold War and the extent to which this did structure or played some kind of role in German-Israeli relations. And in fact, at some stages you say, if I'm not mistaken, you describe Germany's role as a kind of a proxy role for the US. Can you describe, in fact, and you also have this nice quotation where you say, for Jerusalem, the road to Washington went via Bonn. For Bonn, the road to Washington went via Jerusalem. Can you speak about the elements of the Cold How much of what we see in German-Israel relations are endogenous and how much are they structured by exogenous factors in the Cold War? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an indir indirect quote, by the way, um, from Tom Segev's book, um, The Seventh Million. So I'm quoting him there as well. Um, which, yeah, I'm trying to fill with a bit more um, empirical substance, so to say. So as I was saying, in the immediate post-war period, uh, the US tried to play this role of an anti-colonial force in the Middle East, right? It even pushed back against Israel, Britain and France in the Suez um, War, in the Suez attack, right? So this is why the US does not want to openly uh, support Israel, right? And there are other factors as well, but this is a, an important factor. Um, and this is where Germany comes in. How, so as I was saying, for example, this deal, this tank deal was done via the US, but this is only part of the story. So you cannot understand this bilateral relationship without the US, obviously, but the US, you know, as I think, you know, some people would argue, uh, from the left, uh, doesn't it doesn't explain everything. You know, there was you know this kind of genuine uh, autonomous German element as well. So, for example, um, over the Suez Crisis, the U.S. signaled to Germany that it would that it sh should stop reparation payments, which Germany did not do. You know, so there they refused. You know, they were more supportive of Israel than the U.S. Yeah, and there's a few other instances of that as well, prior to 67. Um, so yeah, it's part of the story, but not the whole story. But for Jerusalem, of course, for, for Israel, I mean, of course, you know, Germany, okay, that's good. But of course you want, you know, the US. So that's why the road, you know, 
to Washington Leeds via Bonn, Bonn as well. So in a way, you know, Germany. I mean, I mean, the reason Germany is able to reconstruct so quickly uh, is because it plays this role as a frontline set in the Cold War, right? And this role would later be played also by by Israel. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question about uh, more, more contemporary realities, in particular the post-Oslo situation mm. and Germany's approach to it. Uh, you, you mentioned in your, uh, your presentation the issue of how Germany was a key backer in um, the Oslo process and remains to this day, despite the fact that the process has entirely collapsed and it's led to a completely fragmented reality that is violent structurally and actively, so to speak. You know, it has not resolved the conflict in any, any sense whatsoever. And at best, it can be termed a negative piece. Uh, can you uh, walk us through a little bit what explains the discrepancy between uh, Germany's inability to transition into a kind of uh, acknowledgement that uh, Oslo not only failed, but also might have been the, the extreme power asymmetries and problematics of the accord uh, led to this situation? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing there's a number of questions in the chat already, which we could look at in a bit. I mean, for Oslo, I think you will know better even. I think, again, behind the scenes, and I'm not allowed to quote anybody by name, but I interviewed quite a few German diplomats and, you know, insiders who, of course, know very well that the two-state talk is just the two-state talk, right? The reality is something different. So again, behind the scenes, um, the debates are very, very different. On the other hand, still for the German government, any kind of two-state settlement is generally believed to be the best kind of settlement. Uh, and unless there are any plausible alternatives, Germany will cling um, to that talk. Also, in invested so much money into it already, it would be a shame to to let it go. But the discrepancy is pretty harsh and I try to trace it via anonymous interviews. Um, I mean, this is when the book becomes a bit more anthropological. Yeah, but maybe there's even people in the audience who could answer that question better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and with that, we will transition to questions in the audience. We have about half an hour for questions in the audience. And as Daniel noted, there's a good amount of these. Uh, Daniel has <laughs> run away. Hopefully he'll be back soon, but hopefully he can hear this question. <laughs> uh, ah, there he goes. Uh, the, the first question that I'll pose to him comes from Yako Neko, who says, thank you for such an interesting and thought provoking argument. How did the East and West Germany, how did East and West Germany differ in their approach towards this reinvention? And did foreign developmental aid potentially focus and propel this cause beyond the logic of atonement? I think he basically wants to understand more, if I'm not mistaken, uh, East versus West German approaches to this and how, how that played a role. Mm -hmm. West and East Germany are interesting because they are mirror images. Whatever West Germany did, East Germany did the opposite and vice versa. Right. So it's interesting to see how in the Western camp, West Germany is much more pro-Zionist than anybody else. And how in the Eastern camp, East Germany is much more anti-Zionist than anybody else, right? So they are playing the game to the extreme. Um, there's really good work done on the GDR, on East Germany, um, which I could point you to at some point. So I'm trying to, I try to write a complimentary story to West Germany. So recently, um, Jeffrey Herr, for example, wrote a book on the East German um, state policies vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And he's kind of, you know, making the argument by implication that, you know, East Germany, you know, did really badly and West Germany did really well. Um, but I think both sides were quite instrumental in their approach. And both sides have funny ideological... Um, there are funny ideological consequences to both sides. Um, basically, each formed their own way of being anti-Semitic still, I would argue. Mm. Okay, next question comes from Robert Wittkun, 
who says, thank you for your presentation and book. You mentioned whitewashing was important for Germans, Germany's identity and self-image. Would you consider promotion of human rights and interlaw, international law as a part of its identity today? If so, aren't we witnessing an increasing conflict or difference between di further supporting Israeli policy and supporting Palestinian rights understood from an international law and human rights angle? Why would Germany continue with such risk of destabilizing its own identity? Furthermore, yeah. would you agree that such challenge to German identity today is also represented by the difference between German public opinion regarding Israel-Palestine on the one hand and German state policy regarding Israel-Palestine on the other? Well, that's a big question. Okay. Uh, first of all, yes. If you only look in at German foreign policy in terms of identity, that clearly is the divide. And this is the divide along which you can structure foreign policy debate, right? A universal human rights-based approach versus an Israel-centric uh, rights-based approach. And which is why this whole Oslo thing is so stupidly frustrating to the German foreign policy establishment, um, because it just you know, makes that contradiction so glaring. But until now, I haven't seen how Germany wants to dissolve that contradiction. Well, I am. It's dissolving it towards the Israeli side, basically. Um, that being said, I'm not sure if that neatly reflects German societal divisions, because these are much more complex. So the German government has this very ritualized kind of um, approach, right, talk. German society is divided, but along several lines, right? And you can write five books about how German society um, views the relationship. And there is certainly one strand to, you know, which I would also, um, you know, into which I would come myself as well, which, you know, takes a universal human rights based approach. Um, but I think that's even relatively small. Let's see. Let's hope. Okay. Next question <laughs> comes from uh, Howard Taylor, who asks, how do reparation payments to Holocaust survivors through the Jewish Claims Conference fit within your argument? Do you also see these payments as a form of whitewashing? So in the Luxembourg uh, Treaty, the Reversions Agreement, there was one stipulation that future reparations um, should also be paid to individual survivors, um, which was then being done. And I think much less so than in the original moment um, of reparations being paid to the Israeli state. Um, it's a good question. I don't actually cover individual reparations at all in the book. Um, there's quite a lot of good writing about that. And I think reparations kind of assumed a life, you know, on their own um, after this significant moment in the 1950s where the Luxembourg Treaty was decided upon. But it's interesting to look at German debates at the time as well, because a lot of the proponents, um, social democratic uh, proponents of the treaty, were arguing, okay. You know, let's do this. Let's pay reparations to a state that claims representation for the survivors and victims. But let's not forget the individuals who might also live elsewhere. Right. So I think this could even be argued to belong more to the more genuinely uh, moral uh, aspect um, of German thinking at the time. Can I ask you just a very quick answer, follow up on that? Uh... What is the spread or the division or the ratio between the individual claims for uh, reparations to Holocaust victims as individuals versus that which went to the state? Mm -hmm. the, the well, the individual reparations went on for a very long time, right? So it's also difficult to, you know, to give a very like accurate estimate. But individual reparations, um, you know, they're a lot higher than what was paid to the Israeli state. Back in the day, in 1952, 
is that he said representatives, representatives argued that individual reparations are important, but we need state reparations first because this is a question of survival at this present moment. So I also think you have to look at the quality of reparation payments to Israel, which were a program, as I said, you know, for the 10th time of industrialization at a crucial moment, right, when the state needed to modernize to, you know, survive in a very hostile environment. Sure. So I'm yeah. not sure you can really compare the, 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 the significance of the two, you know, I think they're quite, quite different stories in a way. Mm -hmm. ah. mm. okay. uh, although they're often being justified under the same rubric. Right. That's, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. In any case, the next question comes from Anya Khder, who writes, thank you for this excellent and insightful and important research. Have you found any indirect or direct connections with the U.S. Marshall Plan, which aimed to rebuild post-war German economy with the state building aid to Israel in the 50s? Mm. I think if I may be so honest and point to a weak, poss possible weakness in the book, is I should have done more research on the American side. So maybe I should have done more archival research on the American side as well, right? Um, so maybe there is such a connection, maybe there isn't. I haven't directly found it, but what is clear is that the US was very much in support of quick reparation payments to the Israeli state. And it's also important to know that without Israeli and especially American pressure, Germany probably would not even have paid, you know, um, those reparations. So that, you know, you know, that was the result of a lengthy progress of like pushing the Germans and like telling them, look, if you don't do this, you're going to look bad on the world stage, right? So there is clearly a connection between, you know, the U.S. rebuilding Germany and wanting to. Um, and wanting Israel to, you know, survive in the Middle East. Um, how much that is linked to the Marshall Plan in particular, if I understand your question correctly, I'm not totally sure. But the connection is 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 there, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Wolfgang Biermann, who asked as kind of a two-part question. He says, since 1969, German foreign policy changed with Willy Brandt. Uh, mm. And the first part comes off Willy Brandt's kneeling down for the victims of the victims victims of the war, Warsaw Ghetto in 1971 contributed both to ending Nazi whitewashing in Germany as well as foreign policy aimed at overcoming the Cold War confrontation by mm. the policy of detente. To what mm. extent were the lessons from the detente or change through rapprochement learned or applied or ignored? Uh, in and he adds in the Oslo process. Yeah. So Willy Brandt, this is where it gets interesting, because Willy Brandt, of course, he had to, um, you know, flee from, from the Nazis. He was a, a socialist um, opponent of Nazism. Others, such as Adenauer, waited out, you know, Nazi rule, like, you know, in Germany. So now Willy Brandt comes to power, and he's, of course, you know, linked with the Israeli Labour government through the Socialist, socialist International. Um, he has anti-Nazi credentials, so he should be know, good for the Israeli state, but his foreign policy is not good for the Israeli state. Why? Because of detente, there is this danger or this fear of him moving further towards Arab states, which actually did happen um, via moving towards the Palestinians, via slowly getting to acknowledge a Palestinian right to self-determination. So you have a more universalist human rights-based approach in Willy Brandt, which does not befit Israeli foreign policy. So this is what I talk about in my chapter on, on Brandt, which I think is a very interesting moment when this kind of uh, conservative right-wing party revisionist consensus around Israel um, breaks up and somebody who is much more generally anti-Nazi enters the stage uh, and he, of course, commits to the German commitment to Israel. Like, that's not the question, but he does so in a much more uh, universalist uh, sense, also with his own limitations. But it was Willy Brandt who, after his chancellorship, actually met Yassir Arafat in person, right, uh, along with Bruno Kreisky. So, yeah, that actually links back to the question of, you know, a particular Israel-centric approach versus a universalist 
human rights based approach. And I think Brandt here signifies the latter. And many people in Germany, not for this reason, but for other reasons, would like <laughs> Willy Brandt to return from his grave. To what degree this um, relates to the Oslo process, if I understand the question correctly? Now I lost it. What was the question? If if that kind of thinking was transferred into Oslo, something like that, yeah, 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 yes, probably. I mean, certainly for the Social Democrats, certainly for the you know more you know cent left of center um, parties for sure, but also for parts of the CDU. So I'm quoting a a conservative parliamentarian who's saying. You know, now with Oslo, we can finally overcome this dilemma of, you know, having to square the circle between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so now we can finally come to a conclusion of this whole story. So for Germany, reunification, that's the end of history in Germany, right? Reunification, or basically, you know, integrating the GDR into to West Germany is kind of the end of history thesis for Germany. And Oslo would have been such a nice end of history uh, chapter or element as well by creating Israeli-Palestinian peace. That was the imagination that was clearly there and that clearly did not happen. <laughs> and many Germans still wonder why. Which tells you again, you know, it's a Germano-centric view um, of the conflict. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Francesca uh, Ceccarini if I'm not mistaken, who asks about the impact of the Munich Olympics attack on yeah. Israel-German relations. Can yeah. you yeah. speak to That's that? That's good. It's, um, that is a topic I would like to look at more closely with more archival research, even. It did cause a switch to some degree. I mean, Israel got extremely angry over the German handling of that crisis. I mean, first of all, security in Munich was super lax. Then when the um, kidnapping did happen, the games continued. And then the whole German reaction was a major fuck up. Like, sorry to say, it was, it really was. So, and that of course angered Israel intensely. So yeah, that did cause a crisis, but the fact that it didn't cause that much of a crisis also shows how much Israel needed Germany, right? So Golda Meir, she could complain, but at the end of the day, um, for relations with Europe, Germany was key. And Brandt, he knew that. Um, he knew that and he did not want to let the Israelis interfere with his policy of detente. Okay. Uh, some other questions. We have one from Bill Martin. He asked a question. This is probably outside the purview of your research, but I'm curious to know what you make of grassroots, he puts that in quotations, uh, Zionist activism in Germany today, such as groups like the Anti-Deutsche Movement. Mm -hmm. It is indeed a movement against the background of this more complex history that you paint. Yeah. In the book, I even had like a few pages on the anti doge because they are quite funny. Um, but I left those pages out because I felt that these social societal groups did not really influence foreign policy. I'm not so sure anymore if I look at recent debates in Germany. So maybe in the paperback version, should it ever come out, I will include them. But anti doge or other groups as well Basically, what they talk about is German identity. I mean, the anti deutsche are a great example because they are very, very Deutsch. But others as well, it's always a, a, the debate is always about the German past and about German identity in the present. And Israel is simply a projection screen. It's an object onto which you project your desires, um, your wishes, um, everything. And that goes for, you know, basically most of the debate around Israel and Germany, which is why it's so detached to what's happening in the Middle East, which I find so interesting and bizarre as well, right? And this is what I learned when I worked for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, 
that what's happening on the ground, to use this NGO speak, is very different to what's being talked about in the German ground. So it's weird because these groups form part of a German memory debate. They don't really talk about the Middle East, they talk about German memory. But this debate to some degree influences foreign policy. And I'm not, or these debates, and I'm not totally sure to what degree. It's something I still want to find out. It may be more than I initially assumed. Okay. Uh, Yazid Zade uh, asked a couple uh, questions. He actually asked three. I'm going to select two of them, mm -hmm. uh, although they're unrelated. He asked if you could uh, describe what your theoretical framework was uh, mm. in your argument uh, and simply answer that. But then he also asked, and there's a series of other questions that want to go into uh, Germany's, Germany's heavy presence and role in Palestinian state building. And to what extent is there a whitewashing element going on there? Mm, 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 mm. So in terms of theory, this is an international relations uh, thesis, but I left out all international relations theory because I don't find it very useful. So it's basically a structuralist theory that looks at state interests on both sides, you know, within a Cold War um, framework but that conceives of interest in a broader sense. I'm saying for Germany, there was a material and ideational uh, interest. And, you know, for Israel, there were others. So I don't think this divide between material and ideational, or, you know, basically interest and ideas uh, makes sense. I think it, it's, it's, it's unhelpful for analysis. It's, it's both. And in the case of Germany and Israel, for Germany, um, you know, uh, this is bigger than just a pure material interest because these interests really talk to the whole um, uh, self-identity of the state. Okay, so for whitewashing um, for, you know, Palestinian state building, interesting question. Basically, and I think our moderator can talk more about that, state building uh, in Palestine took place after... Um, Oslo already expired after the, you know, Oslo period exp expired basically in 2000. So this is when state building starts, but it's state building without a state and state building without an idea of where the state and when should actually appear. So what Germany did was to basically follow in the footsteps of the US and fund a process that it did not really determine and that it also did not really want to determine. I think what Germany paid for and continues to pay for is a footprint in the Middle East, is a footprint in one of the most important conflicts still in the Middle East. You know, it's basically funding its own presence. Where that presence will lead is almost a secondary question. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions uh, that uh, want to jump to also more contemporary issues around uh, uh, particularly issues like the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement in Germany and attempts that are being made in Germany to compare these to uh, Nazi laws against the German Jewish community. Uh, uh, Va Valerie Ferron asks about uh, what about the BDS movement in Germany? The question is relates to the accusation of comparing BDS to Nazi laws against the German Jewish community in the 30s. How do you feel about that? Somebody else at the bottom, Salam Bawab, asks about to what extent did the whitewashing of the Nazi past lead Germany to adopt International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism and the declaration of BDS as anti-Semitic? Mm, yeah, I think all of this relates to what I said in the beginning. It relates to the book cover. You know, if you look at the two flags that form one flag, Again, that Germany outlawed BDS, for example, is to is about German identity. It's about post-Nazi German identity. It's about pushing the idea of Germany being anti-Semitic as far as way, away as possible. The irony of that is, of course, that you have a far-right party in Parliament that partially is openly Nazi. You know, it's an, it's, it's a fascist. That, 
you know, a fascist party is the third largest force in German politics. I mean, this fact, you know, alone uh, should make your head, it, it makes my head explode. You know, it makes me extremely angry. Um, and these guys, the AfD, they actually were in favor of an even uh, stricter resolution against BDS than the mainstream German parties. So the AfD, in a way, is the most honest about the whitewashing origins of the relationship, you know. So this is what the BDS thing in Germany is about. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we have, we're about to, we're, we're coming yeah, towards like the I threshold really think, of that. Uh, yeah. uh, what did you say, Daniel? Sorry? So, I, I mean, I know, like, Germany loves to debate BDS, but really, if you want to analyze, you know, you know why that prohibition exists, that's, that's why. Uh, you can cut a long story quite short, I think. Okay, okay. Uh, we have time for maybe a question or two more before we uh, people reach their Zoom saturation. Francesco yes. Hasso had a one of his questions has been answered around East West Germany, uh, but uh, he also has this question of I'm curious to what extent, how, and whether Egypt, in relation to Germany, is the Germany Israel dyad was relevant. Mm. Can you mm. speak a little bit about Egypt? Yeah. So in the, in the core chapters of the book, which are about the 50s and 60s, Egypt plays a key role because Egypt under Nasser is the most important Arab country and also a leading, plays a leading role in the non-aligned movement, right? So Egypt is super important. German politics towards Arab states at the time were basically German-Egyptian um, politics to a large degree. So, and this links back to the secrecy question asked before. Germany really tried to leave Nasser in the dark about all these deliveries, um, right? So the whole secrecy was very much about Arab nationalism, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist Arab nationalism. And it's quite interesting to look at the correspondence that comes in from Arab states after 67, which is like, you know, oh, we thought you Germans were pro-Arab already. You know, that has its own problematic history, obviously, which others talk about. But now you're just, you know, part of the colonial camp. Um, so, you know, what Germany tried to do, to do there didn't work. But yeah, Egypt played a massive role. Um, in the 60s, and that role then, of course, stops under Sadat and with a peace treaty. Okay. Uh, I, I've got time for two more questions and let's see if we mm. can uh, knock them off. Annie Pinkst asks a very clear question. Uh, Ken, could you comment on the contribution of how German reparation payments contributed to Israeli and Western settler colonial project of dispossession still mm -hmm. ongoing? Can you read continuities through through that line of how uh, of, of these channels of aid and particularly yeah. reparations. Yeah, yeah. Let me make a more general point. Um, I think the politics that you can draw from the book are far from clear cut, right? I think if you want to make this argument, you can make it on basis uh, on the basis of what I wrote. I personally wouldn't make it in these terms, um, but I think you could it would open itself up to other types of arguments as well. It really depends on your view of the Israel-Palestine conflict. If you think it's a settler colonial conflict, then Germany further settler colonialism. If you think it's a nationalist conflict, Germany strengthened one side in the nationalist, con nationalist conflict. If you think, uh, like the fight in Germany, that all Palestinians are anti-Semitic, um, then you've done the right honorable thing. Um, <laughs> you know? So I think it depends on how you view the conflict to some degree, at least. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, There's the something final... in it for that. Mm, sure, sure. Uh, sorry Maybe. to have to cut you off there before you finish. But uh, the final question, which I think is probably a fairly apt one, coming from Kamen Givich, who says, mm. hello, Dr. Haddad and uh, Daniel. 
I simply want to ask, what is Daniel's view for the future approach of the EU foreign policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, especially in terms of Germany's role? Let's judging from recent events, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. No, no. If you can hear me still, I think judging from recent developments, Germany does not even want to play a major role, right? When Netanyahu threatened annexation, Germany was against that, but again, kind of balance out critical and not so critical voices within the EU. Um, and then, you know, Germany talked the talk, but everybody knew that, you know, this is what the Europeans have to say, but they're not going to do much. And they didn't do anything. And nobody expected them to do anything, um, really. And then now that it, you know, comes to, you know, the Trump and Netanyahu uh, peace deal, uh, the recent one, you know, the famous Israeli Emirati conflict is finally over. Great. Um, Germany also, of course, applauds it because, you know, it's, it's a good thing. You know, the more peace release, um, the better. But very clearly, this German line of upholding a negotiated two-state solution flies so much in the face of reality. And I think this question can only really be answered um, by looking at the outcome of the U.S. elections in a few weeks. Um, but until now, and I think also with the current foreign minister, Germany's role is rather um, subdued. And in 2020, I really do not want to make any predictions. But, but do you think, actually, just to follow up on this, do you think Israel, uh, Germany is taking a risk by uh, sort of evading and ducking uh, uh, responsibility for this question of upholding the peace process and the two-state solution? I mean... Uh, to some extent, Trump and the U.S. administration certainly become the lightning rod of uh, uh, showing an extreme policy towards, uh, towards the situation there and a very partisanal one. But Germany, as you said, has not stepped up to uh, trying to offer an alternative or defend. And in principle, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of what they're trying to be claimed to do is they're backing U.N. resolutions, etc. But they haven't put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you think the risk factor for Germany on this element is actually rising if they don't take a more serious stand? I think Germany so far has profited from this because what are the Palestinians able to offer? What are they able to threaten, you know, compared to the US um, or also Israel? Um, so for Germany so far, this has been the, um, the most risk-free game it could play. And regarding the recent moves by the Trump administration, I think in general, Germany is trying to wait out the Trump presidency and everybody in Berlin is praying that this very old man, Joe Biden, might somehow win by virtue of not being Trump. I think this is the German strategy <laughs> at the moment. Um, I think it's waiting out Trump. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to see what happens there. Yeah. Uh, but for the time being right now, I'd like to thank you. Uh, Dr. Daniel Marvecki has been our discussant today, uh, uh, discussant, our, our presenter today, so to speak, <laughs> presenting his book, Germany and Israel, Whitewashing and State Building, published by Hearst Press. This event has come to you by the Council for British Research in the Levant in co-partnership with our friends at the Educational Bookshop in East Jerusalem. Pick up a copy of Daniel's book at the Educational Bookshop and support your local uh, bookshop dealers wherever you may be. I uh, would also like to thank Hearst Books for providing a copy of the book. And uh, please also check out our website at www.cbrl.ac.uk for more and past webinars. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, Daniel, and I hope everyone has enjoyed the discussion. I certainly have myself. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you so much. Take care.